Well, I, I don't want us to forget that in, uh, in all of the celebration that we've been having, we're also in a, in a series that has to do with all of that. I want to put our celebration of, of this great milestone of paying off our debt in a context that helps us understand um, that there are also spiritual milestones that we need to, uh, that we need to mark off and, uh, uh, and things like that. And so we're in, uh, in, in this series, the third uh, of four sermons in this series. And today we're going to talk about the past once again, but we're going to talk about building on the past. And so just as a reminder, our, a milestone is an action or event marking a significant change or stage in development. So a milestone in our history, in your marriage, a milestone would be when you met, or a milestone would be uh, when you proposed, or a milestone would be when you got married and you had kids, and, and uh, on and on and on. And, uh, but I want you to know there can be good milestones and there can be bad milestones. We're going we're gonna to take a look at that today. Um, now, how many of you were here last week and got to celebrate with us? I hope, I hope many of you were. If you weren't and you didn't get one of our booklets last week that told a little bit about the history of our church, um, you can take one. They're, they're out in the hallway. We've got plenty and things like that. But also, if you weren't here last week, here's what you missed. Woo! Yeah. Now, um, somebody asked me, can I be like photoshopped into that? And I said, yeah, 300 bucks. That's all it takes. That's all it takes, right? And so uh, all kinds of fun. Um, There was a better picture, Sherry, chance of you um, where you were facing this way, but I like this one. (laughs) Okay, you're facing away from the crowd, uh, from the picture, and uh, it, it seems like everyone's pointing your direction, telling you, uh, giving you instructions to uh, turn around. And uh, we know that you've given us enough instructions that we like it going the other way this time. Okay, all right. So isn't that fun? Uh, we had a good time, and uh, was a was a great celebration. Uh, all all kinds of good stuff went on, um, and. And uh, I told you that some of our former pastors have also uh, contacted us and let us know um, that they're really proud of us as well. And so um, here's, here's one of those, uh, Pastor Dave. Hey, Turning Point. So good to be able to spend this day with you today and celebrate with you on this very significant day when you burn your church mortgage. How exciting that is. Uh, The Shores know that we were so grateful to be called to St. Joseph. And from 1988, September, until about September of 1997, we spent nine great years uh, with your family and our family. Uh, We're so thankful for how the Lord has been faithful through the years. When we came to town, we were in that little bitty church on 10th and Lincoln. So thankful Dr. Merlin Brown bought the church way back when and said, here's a place to worship. God allowed us to grow there, and we grew out of that place and then bought the vacated beauty school, remember? Oh my goodness, what a job that was, uh, transforming that into a different kind of beauty, but certainly the Lord blessed us there and we continued to grow. Not many years after we left and moved to Belton, Missouri, the Lord opened up the opportunity for you to buy the old Frederick Baptist Church and uh, turn it into Turning Point Church of the Nazarene. What a beautiful sanctuary, what a beautiful church building you have and how the Lord has faithfully been with you all these years. And now you get a chance to say goodbye to a mortgage. No telling what the Lord allow you guys to do from this point forward. Just anecdotally, not many years ago, uh, Westside burnt a mortgage as well. And there's so many things that we're able to do that the Lord has been faithfully leading us. I know that he'll do the same thing for you. We love you guys, and we trust that the Lord will bless you this day. And thanks again, Steve, for inviting me to be a part of your celebration. Hey, isn't that great? Isn't that awesome? I get to see uh, uh, Dave frequently on the district and things like that. And uh, um, he's just an incredible, gentle, funny, screwy guy. He just is. And uh, a lot of fun and, and uh, sure love him and love his ministry on our district as well. And love his ministry in the past of our church. What a, what a milestone. So all kinds of people helping us celebrate that. Um, 
But once we've reached a, a milestone, sometimes we, we rush through it too quickly, and we begin to ask uh, an important question, uh, but sometimes it's a, it's a question that's just, just a little bit too early, and we ask the question after reaching a milestone, it's always posed, now what? Let's get on to the next thing. Let's go. Let's move ahead. Now, I, I want to tell you that we will. Next week, we're going to talk about the future. Uh, but this week, I, I think we still need to talk about the past because sometimes the past hangs around in unwelcome ways. And in your personal life, in, in the life of an organization, it just does. And I think we need to face that, and I think God wants to help us face uh, things like that. And so instead of asking now what, um, uh, what, what we're going to begin asking is, Lord, is, is there any healing that needs to take place? Is there anything, any, uh, anything in us that, that needs to be redirected at this time? Now what means we have a moment to rest and reflect and, uh, and for you to do your work in us. And so um, what came to mind as I was dealing with this series was an important time in the life of Israel in the Old Testament. And it was a time when they were coming out of exile. About 583 B.C., Jerusalem was sieged, and uh, many, uh, by thousands, of the best and the brightest of, of Israel were carted off into exile. Um, they were carted off, and, and they were taught to be Babylonian. And then through one political move through another, um, uh, eventually they were allowed out of exile after about a period of about 70 years. And a group of them came back, and under the re, uh, leadership of a, a kind of a local hero named Zerubbabel, they were able to lay the foundation for a new temple because the old temple had been wiped out, destroyed. And so one of the things that they were most proud of as, as a, a nation was the beauty of their temple. And in fact, it, it got a little bit weird because the temple was the place they were supposed to worship God, but the temple ended up being a place that they idolized, which means that they kind of worshiped the temple. And in fact, uh, whenever... Uh, uh, you know, people would say, are you sure about that? Um, you know, they wouldn't say, are, are you for imprint certain? They would say, no, 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 no. Um, uh, they'd say, on the temple, I swear to you. Because they couldn't picture there ever being a time without the temple. But now they've gone without it for 70 years, and this group that has come back has decided to build the temple, and they lay a new foundation for the temple. And this is a huge, huge day. And in the book of Ezra, in chapter 3, we see this a celebration that happens for that. But in the middle of this celebration, something else is going on. And uh, I think we need to pay attention to it. And so I, I've brought up just a couple of verses from here in the midst of all this context. So they are doing a celebration and a dedication of the, of the foundation that Zerubbabel has already laid into the ground. And he's done it um, against great opposition, opposition from outside, uh, because there are people that do not want uh, Israel to be strong again and to come back and to worship God at this temple. And there's some opposition from inside, from people that believe we, we can't possibly, possibly rebuild the temple the way that it was, so let's not rebuild it. But God is in the midst of this, and they begin to celebrate, and Ezra is a priest and then he is aided as well by a couple of, of uh, prophets, Zechariah, one of them. And we'll get into Zechariah in just a minute. Um, but here is what Ezra writes about this. He says, When the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, then it goes on to say there's many celebrations and there's trumpets and there's choirs singing and things like that. And people are cheering, however... In verse 12, it says this, Many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of this temple being laid. There's a couple of scholars that try to spin this and say they're, they're, they're weeping for joy. However, this word that is used for they wept 
is used many times in Scripture, and it is never in a context where somebody mourns for joy. This, this isn't just weeping. They are mourning, and, and there is something that they are mourning here. They see a foundation that has been laid in the ground of a new temple, and they are mourning something. And, and, and uh, there are a couple of other scholars that, that believe one of the things they're mourning is that they're so far from completion. Sure, there's a foundation, but man, we don't even have the money together to, to raise a new temple. And, or, or man, there's so much opposition that is going on out there. But there are other scholars that say it is clear, and it becomes clear in Zechariah that we're going to leave it, read in just a moment, that some people thought, this is too small. You can never restore things the way they were in the past. Let's, let's read Zechariah. Zechariah is a prophet, and the prophet has been sent from God uh, and given the message uh, from God that, uh, uh, to encourage the people to start building this temple, to resettle Israel, to, to, be, to once again become, as a nation, the people of God. And, and uh, uh, Zechariah, if you are just new to reading Scripture or, or maybe you've never read Zechariah before, this is one of those books that you need a little help in reading because as you read it, it is full of all of Zechariah. God speaks to him in the midst of all these dreams. And some of them, quite frankly, you go, man, what did you eat before you went to bed? Because that is a crazy, crazy dream. One of the dreams that he has here is, is God speaking to him through an angel. And here is, here is what this dream happens. Then the angel of the Lord who had been talking with me returned and woke me as though I'd been asleep. And actually, he's still asleep because he's still dreaming. What do you see now, he asked. I answered, I see a solid gold lampstand with a bowl of oil on top of it. Around the bowl are seven lamps, and each having seven spouts with wicks. And I see two olive trees, one on each side of the bowl. Then I asked the angel, and I'm going to put this in Missouri term, what in the world is that? What do they mean? Don't you know, the angel asked. No, my Lord, he, I replied. Then he said to me, this is what the Lord says to, to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength that this temple is going to be built, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's armies. Nothing, not even a mighty mountain will stand in Zerubbabel's way. It will become a level plain before him. And when Zerubbabel sets the final stone of the temple in the place, the people will shout, may God bless it, may God bless it. Then another message came to me from the Lord. Zerubbabel is the one who laid the foundation of this temple, and he will complete it. Then you will know that the Lord of heaven's armies has sent me. Do not despise these small beginnings, for the Lord rejoices to see the work begin, to see the plumb line in Zerubbabel's hand. That's, that's instead of a level, they used plumb lines back then. And then he finally gets to what he was seeing. The seven lamps represent the eyes of the Lord that search all around the darkness of the world. This is the word of the Lord. Yes, praise be to God. Well, we're going to get into this scripture, and uh, I think it tells us a couple of things about the past that are really important. But one of the things I want you to know firmly is something that this passage helps us with. Remember that these people had begun to idolize the temple itself. They had, they had forgotten that the whole reason for the temple was the worship of God, not the worship of a building. And I want you to know, as, as I stand here before you, and as I've talked to previous pastors, that uh, for us, and for my clicker, can you help me? Uh, I th seem to be stuck here. There we go. This building is not and never has been our purpose. Um, I know a uh, pastor that led a congregation through a building campaign and they paid millions of dollars for this building and it was their day to dedicate the building and uh, he walked in 
with a cup of coffee in his hand and said, hi, how you doing? And he was talking with them with his cup of coffee in his hand. And he goes, nice building, isn't it? And everybody cheered and that kind of thing. And he goes, hey, this is God's building. Uh, this is for his purposes. And he goes, guess what? We're going to let kids use it. Yeah, and and uh, uh, nobody cheered. And he says, and, and uh, we're, we're going to use it hard. We're going to use it every day of the week. And, of course, we'll take care of it and we'll clean it. But this is God's building. And everybody cheered once again. And he goes, we're going to let teens use it. And everybody thought about that. And they said, well, man, you know, I, I, I helped them build this building. I, I paid thousands of dollars to, to see this building built. And he goes, no, no, God's going to use it. He's going to bring teens like you never believe. We're going to do outreach to teens. And that kind of, we're going to see people get saved in this building. And he goes, guess what? We're going we're gonna to do some homeless ministry here in this building. And nobody cheered. Nobody cheered. And he goes, well, that's okay. This is God's building. And everybody cheered at that. And then he goes, he goes, one of the things you're worried about is your investment. And he says, if this is truly God's building, then guess what? We're going to use it for God's purposes, and it's going to get dirty now and then. And he took his cup of coffee, and on the brand new carpet, poured it out on the cup of coffee. And he said, guess what? Let me be the first person to mess this building up because this is God's building. Amen. You know what? Nothing makes this place holy except for what happens in the midst of this. I don't know what was said over here, but that's all right. That's all right. All I know is that I said this, nothing makes this building holy, and then I heard cackling over here. Okay, so I don't... Anyway, um, anyway, nothing makes this building holy except for what happens in it. When God meets us in worship, that is a holy moment. When God meets us in prayer, that is a holy moment. When God meets us in discipleship, that is a holy moment. When God meets us in, in the salvation of souls, that is a holy moment. And that is what makes this a holy place, right? It is dedicated to the worship of God. It is dedicated to the ministry of God. But we are going to use this building hard. We have not, and this building has not, and never will be our purpose. We'll take care of it. We'll spend money on it. We'll do the best that we can with it. But guess what? If this building ever goes away, the ministry of our church will go on because you know what our past tells us? Our past tells us that we don't need a building like this for our church to exist. Amen? Yeah, yeah. If we could start out in a building that was leaning and ready to fall over, then we can, we can uh, exist without this building. But it's nice to have, isn't it? At the same time, we're, we're fortunate. We're blessed. But we don't worship this place. We worship the gods that we have chosen to meet in this place. Well, those early leaders those elders wept at the lost of past glory. They saw a foundation in the ground, and whether they were weeping because of what God had done before that had been lost, or because people were looking at the foundation, and I know how people are with things like this. People are looking at the foundation going, nope, it's not the same. Yeah, I can't see how this is going to be a great temple of God. I mean, look at, look at that thing, would you? Right now it's just in the ground, and I know we can't see the building on it, but this isn't going to be anywhere near as glorious as it was in the past. And do you know anybody that lives in the past whose greatest days were in high school? That one touchdown pass that they cost and, and caught, and they've lived on it for 40 years. You know what? Uh, I don't like Bruce Springsteen, but there are some lyrics of his that stick out. And he goes, he, he, he tells us, you better watch out, or one day all you have is boring stories of glory days, right? And, uh, and uh, uh, this is what these elders are doing. They're telling stories of glory days gone by, and they don't see how God could pass, possibly do anything today and in the future. But here's what God was rejoicing over. God rejoiced over fresh beginnings, and sometimes the end of some glory days is the beginning of some new glory days. But our eyes are not open to the fact that God is still at work. God is still there. So there's a couple of things that we need to deal with with our past. And I think there are two ways that we can waste the past. Did you know you can waste your past? 
You can waste it. You're going to go, no, the past is already gone. I, whether I wasted it or not is in the past, right? No. You see, when God is a part of your life, when you've given everything to God, hopefully you've given him your past. And that means, guess what? In God's hand, your past is not wasted. But there are ways that you can waste your past. And the very first is this, that if we wallow in our past regrets, we can ignore God's fresh grace for today and his new steps for tomorrow. You can waste your past by assuming, I obliterated my past. I was no good in my past. I messed up my past, and now God can't use that. And that's wasted time. Here, here's what, what I know about many of us. Not many of us make it through life without some kind of regret, without some kind of thing where we go, where somebody brings something up and we all of a sudden go, oh, please don't talk about that. Or where we're, we meet somebody new on the, or, uh, we're with somebody new and we meet somebody on the street and they've known us from our past and we're standing there the whole time going, oh, don't bring it up, don't bring it up, don't bring it up, Right? There's perhaps people you no longer talk to because they are a solid part of that past. And many times we can look at our past and we can go, I don't like who I was then. I don't like what I did then. And if, if I, if, maybe it could be redeemable if I'd just not gotten in so much debt. Or maybe it could be redeemable if in my 20s sometime I, I realized that uh, just some weekends that, that were fun would turn into an addiction and that I would fight for the next 20 years. Or, or maybe my, my past could have been uh, reconciled if I'd never run across that one person that hurt me so bad. And you know what? We can wallow in our past and assume you know what, there's nothing God can do about that part of my past, and it leaves nothing but broken shards of glass and painful memories, and I'm not sure there's anything that I can do with it, but there's something that God wants you to know, and that is that His mercy and His grace are more powerful than the stain of your past. And God wants you to know His mercy and His grace, this this foundation that is in the ground is God's mercy. You see, Israel had sinned against God, and it wasn't just like they chose not to go to church one Sunday or something like that. For centuries and centuries, they began living as though God did not exist. So God said, okay, I warned you about this day, and so if you're going to live as though I don't exist, let's see what happens when I withdraw my hand of protection on you. Let's see what happens if I act as though I do not exist in your world. And when that happened, Israel was no more. And Israel was overcome, and Israel uh, uh, had uh, centuries then of regret, and they lived in exile. You and I, when we look at our past, we can look at our past through eyes that say, man, if I'd been more mature, I'd be further along. But here's what I know about you and what I know about me, and that is there's no way we would have made it through life without regrets anyway. But the one thing that can happen is that those regrettable things about the past can be forgiven, made new, and changed. It doesn't mean that they all of a sudden became good things that we did. It doesn't mean all of a sudden the bad ways that we treated people are, are now good ways to, to treat people. That's not what we're saying. What we're saying is that through God's grace and God's mercy, those can be forgiven and they can be made new. And those things don't have to define us as they are. Oscar Wilde reminds us of this, and I, I want you to look at the most saintly people in this place. Just, just don't, don't, don't stare. Don't make it weird. Just look over at some of the gracious people in our congregation that you know. Man, they're solid people. I want, I want to be like that someday. And just don't look at me either. That's, I'm not that guy. Just, just look, just, just subtle. If your if your spouse is next to you and they're staring too long, just give them the power elbow. That's all right. Oscar Wilde reminds us of something. He says, every saint has a past. <laughs> One of the things 
that I love about our congregation is that when I talk with some of our older members and I ask them penetrating questions like, tell me how you came to Jesus, there's a sanctified pause. Are you sure you want to hear this? And I want to tell this well, they'll say, because who I was and what I was and what I did, that's a big part of me. But that's no longer who I am because of meeting Jesus and becoming a new person. And it took a while. It took a while for him to shake that out of me, to clean that out of me, and it still comes up every now and then. But somehow he didn't just recycle me. He made me new. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. But not only does every saint have a past, because of God's grace and mercy, every sinner has a future. I like also what, uh, I don't often quote Billy Graham here, but I love this one quote from him that says, don't be bound by your past and its failures. But one of the things Billy Graham didn't want to have done was for you to forget about your past He says, but don't forget its lessons either. And when we are transformed by God's grace and by God's mercy, we we remember our past in redemptive ways. What that means is we don't forget where God brought us from. Lord, let's never forget that there was a time when we were not followers of Jesus before we met his grace and mercy, before we were awakened to the fact that Jesus was pursuing us. Let's never, ever forget that. Because if we forget that, we become harsh and hard-hearted, and we begin to forget the journey of everyone is a little bit different, and sometimes their journey uh, in, in that part of their life before they meet the grace of Jesus goes a little bit further and a little longer than ours, but anyone's history can be changed in a moment when they meet Jesus. Amen. Amen. There's one other thing that I would like, if you ruminate on the past a lot and on past regrets a lot. Here's what I want you to begin to do. I want want you to begin doing a search on God's grace and God's mercy in Scripture. And I want you to begin to think about your past in light of God's grace and mercy. Because here's something that I know about God's grace, and that is that we can allow God to begin using who we are becoming in his grace and mercy, to cast a beautiful light on who we once were. Now listen, that doesn't mean the things we once did are beautiful now, or the things that were once done to us are beautiful now. It doesn't mean that we go, oh yeah, you know, I was assaulted back then, it was a beautiful thing. Or, or oh yeah, oh yeah, I was a rotten person and I used to, uh, to, to just get violent on a hair trigger. And it's a beautiful thing. No. What I mean is this. When God's grace and God's mercy enter our lives, we begin to see how even those things became things that God used to bring us to Him. That even those things don't need to be wasted just by rolling around in regret, they can become brand new, washed, cleansed. And if you don't know that kind of cleansing today, man, Jesus wants you to know it now. He does. He wants you to know it now. But before we get to that, there's another way that we can waste the past. Another way. Here's the other way. While pining away for past glory we can miss the fresh way God is moving now. Um, So I do want to talk directly with a part of our our congregation that remembers the good old days. Amen? We've been celebrating those good old days, haven't we? Now, there's something that I notice every now and then, and it's not a part of every one of us, and I know I fight it as well, But um, we assume that the things that God did or the things that happened in the world 
at the time when we were roughly 20 to 30 or 20 to 35, uh, were all of a sudden the best things that ever happened and can never be replicated again. Any young people ever come across someone who hears someone talk about the good old days and just goes, how could that have ever been good days? Amen? Here's, here's the thing that we do. One of the things that I noticed, um, last year, there was an incredible revival that happened at Asbury. Um, an incredible thing that happened is days after days after days of worship where people were, were becoming Christians, um, giving their hearts to the Lord, confessing sin, um, being transformed. Great things were going on. And, and and Asbury is a school where that kind of thing had happened before. It had happened a long time earlier in that, uh, than that. It happened in the 70s, and, the, and then it, it also had happened much earlier than that um, at that school one other time. Um, I was part of, I'm, I'm part of a couple of social media groups that have pastors. I know it sounds like a really boring thing, and believe me, sometimes it really is, okay? Your fears are confirmed, okay? Um, but um, there were some where I just couldn't believe some of the comments of older pastors, this won't take. This, this isn't what it was. And uh, before I could type my little two cents in there, a very wise person that's quite a bit older than I am said, hang on, let God move the way he will now because we want his fresh, cool breeze rather than the stale, old, dead stories of the past. It does not mean we don't celebrate the past. We've been celebrating the past. But I want you to know this. If you are always thinking, you know, God moved back then in our church. And God was so good to move back then in our church, and I just don't know if that can ever happen again. You know, God was, we were all so close to God back in, back in those days, and I just don't think, you know, in the shape our country's in, I just don't know if people can ever get that close to God again. You, can I just tell you something? I think you're idolizing something other than God when we're saying things like that. I think what you're doing is that you're assuming there was something about people then that God can't overcome now. But what you don't realize is that the main factor in that equation is God, not the people. And here is Zerubbabel standing before elder priests, and they're drowned out by the cheers of the people and as they're, as they're celebrating this foundation that has been laid. But there is this hardcore group of elders that have been through exile now that are mourning the fact that God will never move like he moved in the past and here is Zerub or here is Zechariah with this vision that says but guess what what we don't need right now is the way God moved in the past what we need right now is for God to move in the fresh way that he's going to move now and it may not look like the past but he tells us, don't mourn these small beginnings because what God is celebrating is our faithful steps into this new future that God has for us. Amen? I'm trying to grow old without becoming an old crotchety guy. I'm really trying. And you know what? I don't think the thing that will make me better is if they bring 80s music back. No. <laughs> May Jesus deal between you and I on that. Some of it needs to come back, but not all of it. Um, my brain just went to several <laughs> bands that don't need to come back. All right. I, d I don't want to quote the songs. We'll be on that all day. All right. Here, here, here's the deal. Here's the deal. God's got something fresh for us. And whatever's in your past, it's neither too bad nor too good 
for you to experience what his fresh grace is today. But if you want to stand on the sidelines, and I don't see this very often in our congregation, but I know the temptation is there. And if you want to stand on the sideline and assume our best days are behind us, or the church's best days are behind us, or God's best days are behind him, you have underestimated God. In fact, perhaps you've been worshiping something other than God. It's easy to do. But open your eyes to what God is up to now. One of the ways that we honor the past... See, see one of the things that we're worried about is that people will forget the past. But I I want you to know this. We honor the past and remember the past best when we are faithful to God and build on the past. Not when we become a museum of the past. Um, and one of the best ways to honor the past is to invest in the next generation. Yeah. In fact, some of you are wondering if God's done with you. And maybe, maybe God's done with me. And maybe this message is God saying God's done with me. No, here's, here's what I think God would say. Our generation's task is not done until we've prepared the next generation. Amen? Um, Somebody asked me why I have a lot of younger people preach um, when people feel called to the ministry or if we feel like someone's got gifts for ministry. And I want you to know is because ministry doesn't stop or start with me. God's work is much bigger than what I can accomplish God's word is, is much greater than anything I can say. And I, I want you to know we're, we're going to provide opportunities for people to serve in, in many different ways. And you know what? The first many times that I preach, and still sometimes today when I preached, it was a painful experience. And sometimes we will get incredible, awesome messages, and sometimes we'll go home thinking, well, they tried that out on us. But guess what? God's going to use it and empower it, and it's all part of preparing a new generation for what God is going to do in a fresh new way through them in powerful ways. I hope and I pray that the, be- the best is not behind our church. I pray that the best is ahead of us. Amen? Amen. Well, there's a little bit more in this passage, and we've got, to, we've got to come back to it. It's actually earlier in this passage that Zechariah talks about, and it's so important we don't just dare just gloss over it, okay? Um, so let's, let's go back to it real quick. Zechariah chapter 4, verses 6 through 7. Uh, then he said to me, this, the angel again, talking to Zechariah in his dream, and in his dream, God's waking him up, and he says, <laughs> as, as though I were awake, right? And so this is what the Lord said to Zerubbabel, it is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord, it is not by might or by power. You may have learned that verse. It is, but th- this is how it's going to happen. So, so there's all these outside groups that are against the temple being built. Uh, there's the fact that people just came out of exile. Nobody has any money to build anything. And then there are groups within Israel that don't want to see a new temple built because they just know that God can't bless uh, something that is new and God can't replicate what, what has gone on in the past. So it seems like it's an uphill battle. And, and uh, Zechariah is to tell Zerubbabel, no, don't worry about it. Don't go forming armies to protect yourself against the outside forces. And don't go sharpening your swords to protect yourself from those who are against it from the inside. Because that's not the way this temple is going to be built. It's not going to be built by force or by power. It is going to be built by the strength of God's Spirit. Now, this is really important because it's important for us on, on new steps. I've already heard it. Boy, we've paid the building off. What are we going to do with all this money? Can I tell you what all that money is already going to? Insurance. (laughs) 
Our insurance bill has, has, has more than doubled over the past two years. In fact, I think God knew what he was doing because had we not paid off our building, our insurance would be sinking us right now. So, so just know we're not flush with cash. We're not a rich church or anything like that. In fact, in many ways, uh, financially, we're getting by, uh, by, the, by the seat of our pants uh, right at the moment. Every dollar is going to something, and we're stretching it as far as can, can be done. But, but here's what I've heard. Maybe now we can pour some money into advertising. Maybe now we can pour some money into getting the word out about our church and all these. We can pour some money into social media and all of a sudden. Maybe, maybe we can get our pastor some plastic surgery and hair plugs and $1,000 tennis shoes, and maybe then we'll be um, the kind of church that every young person would want to, to come and be with, right? You do know there's more than one way to grow a church, right? Man, you want a lot of unsaved people here. We could have dancing girls up here, and I think that would draw a crowd, right? What the Spirit is telling Zerubbabel is, do you know what God will bless in the future? Is the same thing that he blessed in the past and that is faithfulness. Remember, our church started pretty small, didn't it? Thirteen people. Uh, I'm sure there was a scat of kids in there as well. But it was thirteen people with no money and no beautiful building. In fact, the district had to pay for the building was $10 a month, and the early, our early church couldn't afford the $10 a month. It was either pay the building or pay a pastor, and they couldn't do both, and often did neither, because they couldn't afford it. And you know what God blessed? It wasn't the fact that they were hip, or, or they were leading the charge in their culture. It wasn't that they had just the absolute best and brightest on their staff. It wasn't that they had everything that was shiny and new and all the bells and whistles to bring in kids and to bring in youth and to bring in all kinds of people. What, what God was blessing in those days in our church was faithfulness among the people. You know what? We can buy everything that we need with money to grow our church except faithfulness. And you know what the most important thing in that whole equation is? is faithfulness. And we can't buy it with money. And that's a good thing. Because for a while we can trick ourselves by buying a bunch of other stuff or by spending money in other ways. You know what? I can buy a service that is a pastoral care service. Which means I could be so busy with other stuff where I can outsource pastoral care because I have no time for it and, and uh, we make everybody else so busy so that they have no time for it either. If we can outsource somebody coming and praying with you. But you know what? I don't think God wants to work that way among us. I think God wants to build the fellowship of the Spirit and the only way that we can do that is to be faithful to the Spirit and to, to follow the Spirit's leading in the midst of that and to care for each other and that kind of thing. You know what? We're not going to pour all kinds of money into those kinds of things to, to, uh, to bring in artificial growth or anything like that. We're going to stand faithful before God one step in front of the other and we're going to do our very best to be what God has called us to be and nothing else yeah and so we're not going to trick our way through this we're, we're not we're, we're not going to outsource our way through this we're, we're not going to buy a bunch of things to get us through our next steps what we're going to do is say lord now what how would you use me now broken old me the me that has parts of his past that doesn't want it brought up in polite conversation. The me that has part of his presence still being transformed by the grace of God. The me 
that still makes so many mistakes. Lord, how are you going to use a group of people like that now? And the way he's going to do it is by his spirit through our faithfulness. Are you willing to take some of those steps with me? One step of faithfulness is coming to Jesus. If you've never, ever given your heart to the Lord, if you've never, ever said, Lord, I don't want my past to rule me. I want my past to be cleansed. I don't want to sugarcoat it anymore. I want to I I be forgiven of it. I don't want it to be a stain on my life the rest of, the, of my days. I, I want it to be redeemed. But today's a good day for that. While God's working on your heart, we, uh, we need to obey this next part. We, you see, what Zerubbabel, or what uh, Zechariah is saying about God's, this is not going to happen by might or by power. The, the promise in that is that, hey, Zerubbabel, God's got this. The temple's going to be built. You will lay the capstone one day, and there will be a loud shouts of affirmation, and all the people that doubted you will look a little silly. But here's the deal. God's got this. Here's the warning in all of this. We move into God's future only when we were, we were faithful to his way. Um, someone who's been faithful is Rosie Hurlbut. Her and Bob... Uh, the story of how they met and all that were, were pretty powerful. Uh, Bob's parents and Rosie's parents were part of this church. Uh, Rosie's parents helped build this church. I think also, um, uh, um, who else was telling me this week? Their, their parents helped build this church as well. Stand up, would you? Stand up. So many great people helped build our church. Your mom was a charter member, you said, right? Um, uh, and, and aren't you glad that your mom was a charter member of our church and that your history has been tied up in our church, hasn't it? Amen. Um, so let's hear Rosie's story a little bit of this. You might okay, check this out. Okay, mom is going to, she's written a few things down, and she's going to talk about some of her memories that she has of um, the church over the years. Well, I had several memories. One was Bob's father was one of the men that helped build the church. On Burnside? On Madison and Burnside. Mm -hmm. And we, we know this for a fact because when they tore the building down, they found his hammer. In the wall. In the wall. <laughs> so where he had dropped it. Yeah. And... In the winter, Sunday school was moved to the basement of the parsonage because there was no heat or water in the, in the church. Only the adults worshipped in the, the church because they had the blankets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we all, I remember we all had to huddle yeah, under blankets. Hot, hot belly stove where <laughs> we all tried to get around. I remember that. We wrapped ourselves in blankets to worship around the stove. And, and when the girls were little... They had a hamster, and I couldn't for the life of me think of the name of that hamster. But anyway, the poor thing died, <laughs> <laughs> and the girls decided it had to have a funeral. So we took the hamster down to the parsonage, and the pastor, I believe it was Pastor Turnock. I was going to say, was it Turnock or was it Harris? I think it was Reverend Turnock. I think it was Turnock. Yeah. And he used to be a children's pastor. Yeah, I so loved he, Reverend Turnock. He understood how that was very important to the girls. And so they buried the, the hamster by the parsonage. And Pastor Turnock presided over the funeral and prayed for the hamster. Uh, and I remember we were very much rooted in the idea of prayer in our church. Whenever a big decision had to be made by the board, we'd have what we called cottage prayer meetings. I remember those. And we prayed. And even at times we had 24-hour prayer. 
I think we had that before we moved to the church on Frederick, where we each... Or Lincoln? Was it the... Because we went from Burnside to Lincoln. Yeah, um, at Lincoln. And uh, we did, signed up for a certain hour during the day. I remember that. And we... Bob and I ended up with 1 a.m. to 2 a.m. <laughs> so we'd have to set the alarm and get up at 1 a.m. and we prayed for an hour and then we went back to bed. <laughs> but we were very much rooted in prayer as the basis for our church. I'm so glad that uh, uh, people who took steps of faithfulness uh, were part of the early part of our church's history, aren't you? Don't you believe that for some of us, anyway, that the prayers Rosie prayed were answered because you came to Jesus? <laughs> because you're here now. And so we want to do the same thing. Hey, there's no new tip, no new trick that is going to help us be significant as a congregation. What helps us be significant is that we are faithful to the God who called us. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Worship team, would you come? Heavenly Father, this morning, you have worked on our hearts. Uh, perhaps... There's someone here dealing with their past. And one of the reasons why they're dealing with their past is because they haven't settled up issues with you. Lord, my prayer is that right now, where they are, in the stillness of the moment, Lord, that they would give themselves completely to you, that they would be forgiven, and that they would be made new and that they would begin to see their past in beautiful new ways, to see where your hand was in certain things, protecting certain ways, and keeping you from more danger than you ever knew you were in. And Lord, may tomorrow be a new day for them. And Lord, for those of us that are here, that have experienced great things in the past, these two are great days. These are days that we'll talk about someday. And Lord, when people talk about these days, we want them to talk about the faithfulness of a group of people that came and paved the way for something beautiful to happen. And Lord, you're doing beautiful things today. And we glory in the idea that you are our king. And that alone in Jesus' name. Would you please stand?